Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. Unlike most ministries, Revolution Church is not backed by grants from larger institutions. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on our website. Thanks for listening. As you all know, I am Pastor Lawrence Richardson. I am not Jay Baker. He is not here today, but he will be back next week. And I am here uh, with his, of course, blessing, but some of his energy because he inspires me. And wherever he's at, I know he inspires everyone else outside of their own boxes. And so I am just happy to be here, hoping to share some of that inspiration that he gives to me with you all. Also, I just want to make kind of a little bit of a plug for some of what we'll call offering at the end. I'll pla- I'll pass the plate. And so just to keep that in the back of your minds. But I really want to talk today about why we are here and what's the point of all of this because I know that for me along my life journey I've questioned that several times why why am I here what's the point so the title today is what's the point why are we here in my church this morning I chose the scripture passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, but I won't read all of that here. I'll only read one verse, and that's my focus verse. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. A very limited elementary view of Christianity would understand the purpose for our existence and the meaning of that verse to suggest that we are supposed to get saved so that we can go to heaven when we die. That's the whole point of why we believe. In some Protestant traditions, they have infant baptism to ensure that if those babies die, that they can for sure get into heaven. And other Protestant traditions have confirmation and believer's baptism to seal the deal. Well, throughout Christian history, there has been so much emphasis on the hereafter, and we've given very little thought on why we're here right now. And what our purpose is for our lives here on earth. You were created for a purpose. I believe that we were all created for a purpose. But I don't believe that there is some giant dry erase board in the sky that says, Tom, when you get to earth, this is what you're supposed to do. Jim, here is where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do, the person you're supposed to marry, the life you're supposed to live. I don't believe that. Not at all. And while I believe that, yes, we are all endowed with amazing gifts and skills, talents and abilities, I believe that it's within our own power to determine what we do with our lives. Why do you think we have free will? It wouldn't make much sense to have free will if we were all predestined to complete some prescripted plan. Tell me the will of God for my life. Why did God create me? And for those that don't believe in God and perhaps believe that life is a combination of random coincidences, what is my function in the greater whole of the universe? Any of those questions sound familiar? Why are you here? Have you ever given much thought to it? Or are you waiting for something or someone to tell you why you're here? Are you waiting for a sign or for the stars to reveal a message to you to tell you what your purpose is? If so, you might be waiting for a very long time. 
You see, with your own mind, your own will, your own spiritual gifts and abilities, you have the power to design and create your own life. I believe that we are made co-creators with God. And what that means is that within you is the power to manifest the kind of life that you feel most inspired to live. Notwithstanding the choices made by others, the circumstances that happen that are outside of our control, and the natural laws of the universe, there is no pre-designed way or course for us to follow. Life doesn't come with a manual. We have guidebooks and sacred texts from multiple traditions to inform our journeys, but we design our life as we go along. I saw a movie once where this man, he was praying that God sent him a job. Now, I am a praying man. I will be the first to start praying for anything, over everything. I, I pray over my food. I pray over, you know, the bathroom before I take a shower. Like, I am a praying man. But every day this man would wake up and he lit a candle, placed it in the window, and he would pray. And this is the prayer that he prayed. Lord, whatever your will for my life is, show me. Whatever job that you have for me to do, reveal it to me. You know my needs and my desires, O oh God. I trust that in your time, you will send me work. Now, I don't believe that there was anything inherently wrong in his prayer. In fact, I've prayed similar prayers. Lord, reveal to me your, your will. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit, things like that. But I believe that what is so striking about his prayer is that he prayed every day for a job that he never actually went out and looked for. He didn't compile a resume. He didn't fill out any applications. He didn't get trained in any specific thing. But he prayed every single day for a job. I believe that God definitely is almighty, all-powerful. But where does the job come from if you never actually leave the house to pursue any opportunities? For those praying for a house or a car, a spouse, peace of mind, healing, transformation, where do those things come from if you put no active effort into pursuing and receiving those things? Praying definitely conditions our hearts and our minds toward God, but it's up to us to use our God-given power to pursue the lives that we want for ourselves. You won't meet the spouse that you're praying for if you never go outside. You won't receive the peace you're praying for if you continue to surround yourself with negativity and chaos. And any recovery program will tell you that if you're trying to get sober, you have to reorganize your life away from the people and the things that trigger you to fall into the patterns of using. What do you want for your life? What do you want with your life? What do you want to accomplish and achieve? Surely all of the gifts and abilities that we have aren't for nothing. There must be something that we can do while we are here that's more than just buying time until we die and go to heaven. In today's text that I read, Paul is addressing the church in Philippi. And out of all of the things that he said to them in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, there are three things that I want to leave with you. The first, be of one mind. When you live in community with others, whether that community is a church community, a, a state, a country, you have an amazing opportunity. Think about it. All of us in this same space with so many gifts and talents and desires and skills, surely if we all work together, we could design and create something magnificent. When I know what I'm working with, and then I know what you're working with, I'm inclined to wonder what we could be working on together. 
When your gifts combine with my gifts, surely something amazing can happen. So what do we want to achieve together in this community that we are in? What kind of life or way of being or environment do we want to manifest together? What kind of world do we want to live in? In order to create together, we must first build relationships with one another. No more siloed living, you on your side of the fence, me on mine. Get to know the people around you. Find out what their strengths and abilities and skills are. Figure out how we can together move forward toward manifesting a shared reality for our future. And the second thing that I want to leave you with is live in harmony. One of the tricky things about people is the underlying fear that most of us have of difference. I believe that this fear is somehow tied to feeling inadequate. And somehow this suggests that if I don't have something that you have, or if you have something that I'm lacking, then I'm not good enough. I love being around people that have skills and gifts that I don't have, because then I know who to go to when I need that particular thing. There's nothing wrong with not knowing everything, not having it all, not knowing it all. We live in this consumer driven world that says we must have all these things to be happy. But what if we were happy with what we had within us? What if we were happy for someone else because of what they had within them? Once we learn, I believe, how to live together and work together in spite of our differences, perhaps we can begin to live in such a way that celebrates our differences instead of being afraid of one another and our differences. The third thing that I want to leave you with, and the final thing that I want to leave you with is, discover what it means to truly be saved. I know that word scares a lot of people because of how it has been used and misused throughout Christian history. But the Greek word for salvation is sozo, which means to be whole. What does it mean to be whole? If the original meaning of the word sin is to miss the mark, then perhaps the opposite of sin is not holiness, but wholeness. What does it mean to be whole? What kind of circumstances are required for you to feel and be whole? What does wholeness look like for you? We can so easily get caught up in acquiring things that we believe will make us happy and satisfied, but what do we really need? I asked my congregation this morning, what they need to be whole. And I had them write things down. And I had them really think about it because I believe that we know what we want. We know what we desire. But what do we need to be whole? Only you can answer that question for yourself. I can't answer it. Your parents can't answer it. Society surely can't answer it. Only you know what you need to be whole. Paul tells the people in Philippi to work out for themselves, to understand for themselves the details of their own salvation or the details of what will make them whole. I encourage you to do the same. Despite what some churches or traditions may teach you about sin and wholeness. What do you believe will bring wholeness for you? And likewise, what causes you to miss the mark from finding that wholeness for yourself? What is the point of all of this and why are we here 
Is it to entertain one another? To continue to kill one another with war? To continue to perpetuate discrimination and, and, and separation? Pain? Destruction? Or is it unity? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it wholeness? Where nothing is missing and nothing is broken or destroyed. Where we can find unity and come together. I believe that we were created to be whole. And in that wholeness, I believe that we were designed to manifest express and cultivate similar environments and circumstances where we all can thrive together in spite of and despite our differences because until all of us are free and whole none of us can be be of one mind live in harmony and discover what it truly means for you to be saved. These are the words that I have for you today. As we leave this place, I encourage you to think about your wholeness, what that looks like for you, what you need to be whole, and to be free. Thank you for your time today. Namaste.